Good morning, church. It's been a hot week, uh, but thankfully things have cooled a little bit. Um, and you know, um, what's interesting is that from week to week, a lot of things happen, a lot of things take place. Uh, and, you know, I know sometimes it's like this running joke. Sometimes you, uh, you see us pastors and you, maybe there's the underlying assumption that we're just there on Sunday. But a lot of things happen in between the Sundays. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to remind all of us is that uh, we should all be thankful that the Lord brought uh, our Pastor Hanley back safely from his doctoral studies over there in Kentucky. Um, he, he was one of the few, he was one of the, the many, actually, who had to brave that Southwest delay. And so he was able to make it back and uh, to be with us again this morning. This morning we're going to talk uh, about a passage from the book of Acts. As a church, we've been studying through it for a while. Uh, We've been taking various breaks, but we've been trying to stick to God's Word and to preach verse by verse, section by section through it. And when it comes to the New Testament, there are two figures who loom large on the stage of the New Testament. The first, of course, is Jesus Christ. Uh, that, That much should be obvious. But the second is really Paul. The Apostle Paul was used by God to write 13 out of the 27 books of the New Testament. And by word count, by the by the number of words, by the volume that he has written, God used Paul to write about 23% of the New Testament. When it comes to the issue of missions and looking for, well, how do we set forth and proclaim the gospel in other countries, in other cultures, Oftentimes, many organizations will appeal to and look to the Apostle Paul and the record of his missionary journeys. When it comes to church life and church ministry, when it comes to how do we we know who we should ask to lead the church and whatnot, many people will turn to the epistles that Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus concerning church life. As Christians, we have more New Testament books written by Paul and about Paul than any other person besides Jesus Christ. So it should come as no surprise that there is a lot that we can learn from Paul's life. And last week, our pastor Albert preached about spiritual leadership from the life of Paul from Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 38. And just to remind you, Paul walked his talk. He taught the whole counsel of God. He expected suffering, and he shepherded the flock of God. And today, again, we're going to be sitting uh, from sitting here and learning from the life of Paul, and we'll be looking at his faith, which is indeed a faith worth imitating. And there are two lessons I want to draw from the life of Paul. First is Paul had the fervent faith to follow God. Paul had a fervent faith to follow God. The first 16 verses of our passage this morning contains a record of Paul's travels, and we'll get there. But like a travel agent, I mean, Paul brings up all of these different places, these different cities, this different, these different islands. And, uh, Luke tells us exactly the path that Paul took to get from Miletus to Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but whenever I read through a list of hard to pronounce names, or hard to pronounce places, I'm, I am really tempted to tune out. Because I don't know these places. In fact, as I read it, even in my mind, even as I read it in my mind, I kind of stumble on how to, well, is it pronounced this way? Is it pronounced that way? And it is tempting when you read the Bible, when you come across all of these names, these places, to just kind of, kind of s- skim over it. Right? Uh, but here we are. <laughs> Uh, thousands of years removed from this passage and thousands of miles from these nine places that are mentioned. And I want to be of help to you, so I put together a map for us to see. And so instead of just reading or hearing about these places, uh, I find it helpful, I've always found it helpful to go to a map and to draw out the path. All right. Uh, so here is a map of the eastern half of the Mediterranean Sea. It's a little bit stretched uh, vertically, but that's just because of the aspect ratio. But um, it's the eastern half of the Mediterranean Sea, and everything here is east of Italy, that big boot in the middle of the Mediterranean. 
Zooming in on Paul's particular path, that is the path that he took. That dotted line that you see is the path that he took from Miletus to Jerusalem. And last week, we know that Paul started in Miletus. So that's where we're starting out. And now I want you to take your Bibles out if you haven't already and turn with me to Acts 21, verses 1 to 16. And I'll read it. And as I read it, okay, here's, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Just listen as I read it and watch the screen. Because as we go through it, I'll show you what, what we're talking about so you can see exactly the path that Paul took to, from Miletus to Jerusalem. All right? Acts 21, 1 to 16. Verse 1. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos. And the next day to Rhodes. And from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there, uh, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days were ended, When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were there, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own hand, his his own feet and hands, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there encouraged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. So this is Paul's path to Jerusalem. This is, uh, this is what I try to do when I study the Bible because I'm like, well, what are all these places? I can't even pronounce them. I try and go to the back of my Bible and this, this map you would probably find in the back of your Bible. And you may even have you know, some of these, uh, the arrows, the lines, the dotted lines that tell you the journey that Paul took. But when I read something like that in Scripture, it is a temptation for me to just tune out and go, okay, he went from point A to point B. Does it really matter where he went? Does it really matter how far he traveled? Does it really matter, you know, where exactly he stopped? And I think uh, we know that the answer theoretically uh, at least intellectually, is, no, is yes, of course it matters. It's written in God's Word and it was preserved for a reason. And by the numbers, Paul's trip from Miletus involved five different stops. The journey likely took some three to four weeks and it covered about 715 miles. And Paul traveled both by sea and by land. And so needless to say, this is not just some one-day short trip This is not, you know, something that we just went from here to like West LA. This is a serious trip. This is quite a long, lengthy, and arduous trip for Paul. This was something that was physically demanding. In addition to the physical obstacles, however, Paul also faced emotional and spiritual obstacles. So Paul did not just go through all of these places and say, look, I'm going from point A to point B. But whenever he had an opportunity, he stopped off to greet the brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think that's important. He's using his time well. 
And it's important enough to Paul, his brothers and sisters are important enough to him that he would bother that if he's in town, he wants to go and see them. He wants to stay with them. He wants to talk with them. But there are more obstacles than just the physical ones. And so here we see there are some emotional pleas from the brethren in Tyre and Caesarea. Last week, we, read, uh, we studied that Paul had said a sad farewell to the Ephesian elders. And one of the reasons it was sad, I mean, saying goodbye is always sad when you love people. But it was sad because they all knew that they would not see Paul again in this lifetime. And so it was all the more sad when that happens. Paul at this time, he's an older man, but he's by no means you know, so old that he couldn't do a month-long trip. And he's not going to die of natural causes. And so his beloved brothers and sisters in Christ all are aware that there is persecution waiting for him. And they know that that persecution will ultimately culminate in his death. So when Paul arrives in the city of Tyre, he stayed there with some believers for seven days. Now, is there anything significant to seven days? No, not really. I think the seven days was just the time that the ship needed to unload all of its cargo and reload for the next journey. Um, and there, Paul is warned of future persecution in Jerusalem. Look with me at verses 4 to 6. It says, And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to, to, go, not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. So these verses tell us that these believers who were in Tyre, they knew Paul, uh, they knew that somehow through the Spirit that Paul would face some persecution, and as a result, they told him not to go on to Jerusalem. Then he goes to Caesarea, and as he's moving closer to Jerusalem, Paul is also warned in Caesarea, in the house of Philip. Now, Philip is referred to as one of the seven. He's one of the original first appointed deacons back from Acts chapter 6. Verses 8 to 9 says this, On the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now, evidently, Philip was a respected leader in the church, and not only was he a respected leader, his daughters were very spiritual. Verses 10 to 12 continue. It says, While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When, he, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. So this prophet Agabus comes and visits, and he reveals to Paul that Paul is going to be in prison in Jerusalem. And he does this, uh, he, he does this through, uh, you know, by, by showing him. You know, back then they would wear these really long belts, Okay, because they would use it uh, kind of almost a little bit like a girdle. They would wrap it around. And oftentimes, you know, nowadays we have money belts, right? And we would tuck money there to, for safekeeping. And this would be similar to what Paul would have done. So Agabus is taking the time to do this visual representation and, you know, taking, walking around Paul, un undoing his belt and binding his hands and feet and saying, this is what's going to happen to you. This is what's going to happen to you. And as a result of learning Paul's predicament, the believers there try to prevent Paul from going to Jerusalem, to which Paul responds passionately, verses 13 to 14. It says, Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. Paul says, you're breaking my heart. Now this idea of breaking my heart, uh, the, the, word, the word idea of breaking is what you would do if you had a dirty rug and you put it out on a clothesline and you took a big bat and you just started beating the rug to try and beat the dust out of it. That is what Paul has in mind when he says, you are beating my heart, you are breaking my heart. 
These people loved Paul, and Paul loved them. It wasn't, Paul didn't go to Jerusalem to face persecution because he had some sort of death wish or because he was some suicidal maniac. He went there because he was convinced that the Lord was leading him there. And yet, even though as he's going, his dearest friends and companion, his brothers and sisters in Christ are begging him, please don't go. Don't do it. Don't go there. There can be nothing but trouble for you over there. These are brothers and sisters in Christ who are dear to Paul's heart. He had endured beatings, a stoning, and many other forms of persecution already at this point. And yet this, and we see here the heart of a shepherd for his sheep. And we see also the heart of the sheep for their shepherd. And, and you know, this is, this is one of the reasons why, you know, whenever, whenever you have a pastor leave for any reason, people are hurt. Is because there's a connection between the pastor and the people. And if there's not a connection there, and if there's no sadness that accompanies a pastor's departure, uh, then something was wrong. Right? If neither hurts, neither party hurts, then something is wrong with that relationship. Now, if Paul's journey to Jerusalem was painful for him and his friends, and everybody was telling him, hey, it's going to hurt, then why was he going? What is it that's motivating Paul? So we look at Paul's motivation. Why is he going? Well, Philippians 1, 19 to 21, a famous passage for us, helps us see, well, what is Paul's mentality? What is his mindset? What is his perspective on life for God? He says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Paul says this, I want to honor God no matter what happens to me. My life is not my own, and I live for the glory and honor of God alone. And so if God wants me to die, I will die. If God wants me to live, I will live. If God wants me to die, I will die for his glory and honor. If God wants me to live on, I will pursue ministry that honors him. Paul is absolutely, totally, 100% sold out for God. And Paul is willing to say, God, whatever you want, I will do. He serves at the pleasure of the Lord. And one more specific motivation for Paul here is that he's bringing a gift. He's bringing a very specific gift for the Jerusalem church. In verses 13 to 14, we read about this prophet named Agabus. Okay? And, and this Agabus guy came out here and, and he had this prophecy. And he said, hey, this, this guy Paul here is going to be bound when he goes to Jerusalem. This is not the first time that we hear about this prophet Agabus. He shows up. In Acts chapter 11, verses 27 to 30. So it's about 11 months ago that we looked at that passage. And it says this, Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul, who is now known as Paul. So Agabus is not some crazy person. Agabus is a prophet that Paul has interacted with before and that Paul has responded to before. In fact, Agabus was the catalyst that sent Paul on this journey to go and collect financial aid and financial re relief for a pending famine. This is what he says in Romans 15, 25 to 27. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem. Why? Bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. Now, I want to pause here okay? because it seems like there's something strange. There seems like a tension in this passage, if you haven't already noticed. 
Because believers from Tyre and Caesarea are telling Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. We've got God-fearing believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, telling Paul, don't go, don't go, don't go. And Paul says, I will go. Don't stop me. So should he go or should he not go? Is it right for him to go or is it not right for him to go? Are we getting mixed signals? Is the Holy Spirit saying one thing, Paul saying another thing? Is the Holy Spirit kind of say one thing and changes his mind? Is he going back and forth? What is going on with this situation? Because it seems like all the brothers and sisters are telling Paul, please don't go, and Paul is going. Does that mean that Paul disobeys the direction of the Holy Spirit? Is Paul being stubborn-headed here? Does he have some sort of death wish? Does he have martyrdom on the brain? Well, John Stott summarizes it best when he says that the Holy Spirit had issued a prediction, a prediction, but the prediction was not the same as a prohibition. In other words, the Holy Spirit revealed to Paul what would happen, but the Holy Spirit did not say, don't go. In light of the prediction made by the Holy Spirit, the believers could not help but try to prevent their beloved brother, Paul from going to suffer in Jerusalem. So Paul's not doing anything wrong. In fact, there are, many, there, are many, uh, there are many other verses here that refer to let the will of the Lord be done. Well, if you knew that the will of the Lord was to not go, then you wouldn't say such a thing and you wouldn't allow Paul to go. When Paul testifies later and when he goes to trial, he says, I have done nothing wrong. My conscience is clear before the Lord. And the reason his conscience can be clear is because he knows that God is not telling him not to go. God is not preventing Paul from going to Jerusalem, but God is at least telling him what's going to happen. So Paul's not doing anything wrong. In fact, he's doing something that he'd already committed to do a long time ago, right? Agabus made that prophecy and Paul responded. Paul and Barnabas responded and said, we will go around to the other churches. We will collect offering and we will come back and support the church that went the church that sent missionaries to them. We will come back to the mother church and we will come back and and support them. So Paul is simply completing the mission to bring a monetary gift to the believers in Jerusalem that he had committed to a long time ago. He's just fulfilling his responsibility. And yet standing in the way of the finish line is this huge obstacle that is physical persecution and imprisonment. See, Paul knows what he has in front of him. He knows that he will be imprisoned. He knows that drama will come about. He knows that it will not go well. He knows that there's going to be problems. And yet Paul still has the fervent faith to follow God. You know, like Paul, our decisions in life are often tied to our faith in God. If we believe that God is worth more than anyone or anything in this life, we can be used in tremendous ways. God does not limit our faith. I think we limit our faith. God doesn't change. It's whether we really believe he is who he says he is. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think sometimes we're afraid of what our belief in God will cost us. We're afraid of what it might mean to be a Christian and to live for Christ. Students, have you ever been afraid of telling people that you're a Christian? Have you ever been afraid to speak up in a biology class? about intelligent design as opposed to evolutionary theory. Young adults, how often have you wondered what it would be like to sleep in on a Sunday morning? How often have you wondered what it might be like to date that attractive and fun non-Christian person? Parents, in the workplace, how often have you looked down at the floor sheepishly when topics like abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism come up? Have you ever written a check for offering and wondered if it was even worth it? 
You see, all of us face obstacles. Because if we really believe things, it costs us. And oftentimes, God uses trials to test the resolve and the depth of our faith. Why do you think we look up to people like missionaries? Because we see them and we see that they had a faith that was so fervent and so deep that they were willing to give up comforts of life to go to a place unknown, to a people they do not know, to a land that they are unfamiliar with, at risk of life, at risk of health. Because they believe so firmly in the God who saved them. Now let me just make it really clear. The reason that we look up to them is not because they've got some special access to God. It's because they believe what God has said more than we do. And how do we know they believe it more than we do? It's because they're willing to put it to the test. They're willing to lay it down and they're willing to sacrifice it. That is why we look up to them. Because faith can cost us. That's why sometimes when we share the gospel, I don't want to just tell people, it's an upgrade on your life. It is an upgrade. But the upgrade comes with the cost. The security and the salvation through Jesus Christ comes at the cost of, you do not have the ability to just tell God no. You say, God, yes, sir. And oftentimes, God sends trials to test our faith. Trials are difficult because they oftentimes threaten to take away things that we hold dear. Job security, financial stability, control over a situation. But it is through those trials that God shows us where our faith is strong and where our faith is weak. The depth of our faith is revealed by our willingness to sacrifice. As fellow believers, we should consider the life example of Paul's fervent faith. He was willing to follow God, and he knew adversity was coming. He knew that persecution was promised by the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not probably, it's for certain. As certain as Paul was that God is who he said he was, Paul was sure he would be persecuted in Jerusalem, and he went anyway. And that is a fervent faith worth imitating. Secondly, Paul has a compassion and concern for Christian co-laborers. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, Paul goes there to see the believers. And while he's there, he gives them a praise report, an update. This would be similar to a missionary coming back from the field and giving an update in prayer meeting. Verses 17 to 20. It says, When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. Paul gave this wonderful update. He gave this wonderful report about Gentiles and what God had done among them. And he's talking to all of the church leaders. He's giving this report before the most spiritual people in the church of Jerusalem. And they respond naturally by giving praise and honor to God. They say, that is amazing. And that is so amazing that only God could have done that. And while we may not have a record of what Paul exactly says here, we do have a record of what happened in Acts. And basically, Paul is summarizing for the elders what has happened between Acts 18 and Acts 21. That's what he talks about. And the most important part is that non-Jews, Gentiles, are being saved. Even though these Gentiles grew up worshiping every other God except the one true God of the Bible, they're being saved. Even though it is completely antithetical and countercultural for everything that they've known, they are being saved. Even though it means an entirely new way of life, a new set of values, something that they are entirely unfamiliar with, they are still coming to Christ. And that is exciting news, and that is the praise report. Now, the church leaders are all rejoicing with Paul on this, and yet there are some in the church 
who had some concerns, maybe not these elders, but some, in, some people, some Christians back then, had concerns and reservations about what Paul was doing. The elders are all on the same page. They're saying, this is great, Paul. We're glad you're out there ministering to the Gentiles. They need God. We need God. Everybody needs God. This is good. This is all great stuff. But when Paul comes back, the elders also start this little conversation because not all is well. Not everything is peachy. There's a little bit of racial tension. Look with me at verses, verse 20, second half of verse 20 to 26. It says, and they said to him, okay, and when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is there to be done? What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there's nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Now, this is a little bit strange, and uh, I remember reading this and I was like, what are they doing? Why are they shaving their heads? What is the matter? What is the big deal? Now, Christianity is built upon the foundation of the Old Testament. Jewish Christians, therefore, had to sort through their customs and their traditions and their way of life. On the one hand, this is part of their culture and heritage. But on the other hand, Christianity taught that these rituals do not and could not save. So they're kind of stuck. And so as a result, many of the Jewish Christians, they said, well... We're Jewish. We do things the Jewish way. Uh, We grow up and we do these things. We've been doing these things since we were born. It's like part of our culture. It's part of being Jewish. We will do the customs, but we will not believe in their power to save. Okay? Paul had gone out to the world and he spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he spoke to Gentiles, non-Jews, he told them that they did not have to adopt Jewish tradition and culture And Gentiles did not, in other words, Gentiles did not have to get circumcised in order to be saved by Jesus Christ. In other words, they said, look, if you're not Jewish, you don't have to become Jewish as like a first step and then get saved. You can just become a Gentile Christian. You don't have to be a Gentile who converted to Judaism or to a Jewish way of life to become a Christian. And some Jewish Christians were here accusing Paul of telling Jews who lived outside of Israel to completely abandon their cultural traditions. Um, These Jewish Christians even went so far as to say that Paul told that Paul told Jews to not circumcise their children. And this is a really touchy subject here. Because back in Genesis 17, God told Abraham that circumcision would be the sign of their covenant. In other words, to be circumcised back in the day when you were Jewish meant that you were a descendant of Abraham. So if you did not get circumcised, or if somebody was teaching you not to do that, it was like you were saying, I am done with being Jewish, and I give up my Jewish uh, ethnicity. And Jewish Christians were basically, some Jewish Christians were basically accusing Paul of teaching Jews outside to abandon their race and abandon their heritage. So there's that racial tension. Okay. Now, in an effort to set the record straight, James suggested that Paul participate in a Jewish cultural tradition. Specifically, James asks Paul to financially sponsor four men who had undertaken a vow of consecration. 
But in order to be their sponsor, Paul had to undergo a ritual purification lasting about seven days. So he had to sponsor these men financially, so he's paying, and he's also undergoing purification himself. And by doing those things, they hoped that Paul would show people that he was not anti-Jewish culture. He's not telling people who are Jewish, who become Christian, that they don't have to do any Jewish cultures. He's not telling them to stop either. He's telling them that it does not save. Now, I want to pause here again because I want to ask this question. Why did Paul agree to do this? And was he right to do it? Sponsoring these four men was very expensive. And the Jewish Christians here are falsely accusing Paul of teaching these things. Paul is being accused falsely. And Paul knows the truth. And the Jerusalem elders know the truth. And most importantly, God knows the truth of what Paul teaches. So why does Paul go through all of this hassle? Why does he undergo the seven-day purification? Why does he spend money to sponsor some guys who want to go shave their heads? Why does he have to prove himself when he knows that he's been teaching what is right all along? Why would he do that? Why can't these people just trust him? And here's where you see Paul's heart shine through. Because the reason he's willing to do that is because he has compassion and concern for his Christian co-laborers. Paul knew that he didn't have to do this. It wasn't like he he said, oh, well, I better do this. No, he, he knew that it was not obligatory, that it was optional. And he chose to do it. He chose to undergo all of this procedure because he has compassion and care for brothers and sisters in Christ who are falsely accusing him. Paul did this anyway, even though he didn't have to do it. He was willing to sacrifice his pride for the sake of unity in the church. Paul was willing to make a concession for the sake of culture and tradition. After all, what was Paul there for? He was coming to bring a monetary gift from non-Jews to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem to show them that these non-Jews, they are your brothers through Jesus Christ, and they love you even though they are from different cultures, even though they are not of your race, even though they cannot lay claim to being descendants of Abraham. In the bigger scheme of things, Paul is trying to show the church in Jerusalem these other people are legitimate, authentic believers, and they may be different. They may not have grown up on the, under the Torah. They may not have grown up with the Mosaic Law. They don't look like you. They don't act like you. They eat a lot of pork and a lot of things that you wouldn't touch. But you know what? They love you even so because they are bought by Jesus Christ. And he is trying to show the Jerusalem church, the Jewish Christians there, these people are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you may not know them. And you may never have a blood relationship with them because you're from a different culture, a different a different line, a different ancestry, but they love you still. And so in the greater scheme of things, Paul is trying to show these people in Jerusalem that the people outside who are becoming Christians love you too. The whole point of him coming was to bring a monetary gift. And what's the monetary gift supposed to do? It's supposed to help sustain them during a famine that was coming. And who would be fed through that monetary gift? the people who are making these false accusations against Paul. What kind of compassion is that? What kind of care is that? When people hurt you and me, we hope that they get what's coming. Somebody cuts you off on the freeway or just zooms down the left-hand side, you know, going 100 miles per hour, you know, scaring everybody else. You know, you're secretly hoping that the cop's going to pull them over and you're going to see them later and kind of go, bye-bye. Or sometimes, you know, you play, well, okay, maybe that's just me. But I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, you play that game in traffic. You know, you see that guy who's darting in and out, you know, trying to play NASCAR. And you're just, you're just cruising in the same lane and you're just secretly watching him because you're like, I think I'm going to beat you. You're causing all this trouble. You're causing all these brake lights. You're, 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 you're propagating traffic, but uh, I'm still going to beat you. You know, and sometimes we just hope that they get a little bit of what's coming to them. There's not any of this in Paul. 
Paul's being falsely accused, and he loves them still. He's being falsely accused, and he's saying, I'm bringing that monetary gift to support you, to feed you. I am coming to feed the mouth of the one who accuses me of all these false things. This is Paul bending over backwards out of compassion and concern for his Jewish Christian brothers and sisters. And this is what Paul means in 1 Corinthians 9 where he says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. He's trying to reach out to the best of his ability. Now let me just say, I will admit openly and fairly that Paul's actions are not familiar to us. Okay? After all, we are thousands of years removed from purification rituals and Nazarite vows. And to be honest, even the theologians, they're not exactly sure exactly what this ritual entailed. But I think that all of us can understand what it means to swallow our pride for the sake of a fellow believer. We understand how difficult it is to consider someone else's interests above our own. As Christians, we are part of a huge family. A huge family. And we don't get to vote on who enters that family God only gets to decide. And through Jesus Christ, we are connected to all different types of people from all over the world with all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of different worship styles. They worship in many different ways. And it is our privilege to be in the same family with them. It is a blessing to know that there is a greater family than what you see here. That there is a family that exists beyond the walls of our church in other parts of the country, and in the world. We know that we should be thankful for them. We know that it is a blessing. We know that it's a privilege. And we know that we ought to be thankful. But do we live out that knowledge? Do we live in accordance to that knowledge? You know, sometimes we set up double standards. And and while we hate double standards being applied to us, we inadvertently set up double standards for other people. And sometimes that higher standard is applied to people in the church. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, I can't believe that person does this to me. And you know what? It's in the church. Why is it that we can get angry and impatient parking our cars so that we can come and worship God? Why is it that we can speak harshly to each other? Why is it that we argue so vehemently about worship style and which song was sung or how the worship service went and how it flowed or how it didn't flow? What sound check problem happened? What this happened? How, how is it that we can have that kind of perspective? Have we forgotten the compassion and concern that we ought to have for our Christian co laborers Have we forgotten that this is a family? I didn't say it was a perfect family, <laughs> but it's God's family. See, Paul had every right in the world to just turn that accusation back and say, they're totally wrong. That is ridiculous. That is ludicrous. I can't believe someone would even accuse me of something like that. But here we see he just says, look, I'll do it. For the sake of unity in the church, for the sake of unity between Jewish and non-Jewish, He was able to see the bigger picture instead of focusing in on the minuscule details. He was able to see that all that it took for him to have this fervent faith to follow God in this particular situation was for him to swallow his pride and just say, look, if they want me to do that, I can go ahead and do that. And what would it look like for you and me to exhibit a similar faith and a similar compassion and concern for God 
our fellow believers here at this church? Perhaps we would not complain so much. Instead of asking, why don't we have this? Why don't you do this? You should do this more. You should do that more. Would it be more sounding like, could I help more in this way? Could I contribute more in this way? What steps can I take to help this process or this area? The Apostle Paul has a lot to teach us from his life. A lot. He has this fervent faith to follow God even when it costs him. And Paul's faith is expressed through his compassion and concern for his fellow Christian co-laborers. Now, if you think about it, it sounds familiar. Here we have Paul going to Jerusalem, knowing that he will face persecution and imprisonment. Here we have people who love Paul so much that they try to prevent him from going to Jerusalem. Here we have Paul reaching out to love the people who falsely accuse him. Paul's example is certainly something to behold, but he's just a copy. He's just a copy of Jesus Christ. Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem knowing that he had an appointment with death. People who loved Jesus so much, Simon Peter stands out and said, this shall never be. And Jesus rebuked him. And Jesus, hanging on the cross, dying, pleased with God to forgive those who have put him there. It was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who willingly embraced the cross in Jerusalem in order to love the people who spoke out against him. And that is precisely why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11.1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so we imitate Paul's example. But we imitate it because Paul was imitating Christ. And it's a faith that is worth imitating. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this passage. We thank you for reminders from your word and more, in, more specifically from your son and from Paul who was imitating your son. We ask for your grace. We ask for your power that we may obey you that we may lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, that we may run with endurance the race that is set before us, that we may look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. We ask, Lord, that you would give us that kind of faith, that you would give us that kind of resolve, that you would give us that kind of compassion, that kind of deep concern for others. Because, Lord, we know that this life that we live is not our own, but it belongs to you, for we have been bought with the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we get to live for you. We pray all of this in your Son's name.